Good, good morning. Um, thank you very much to, to this particular session. My name is Memo Ngui from Industrial Psychology Consultants. Uh, our speaker today is Mr. Alois Mshayendebu, who is a, a psychologist, he's an occupational psychologist. He's also an OD specialist. Uh, Mr. Mshayendebu uh, is currently based in Botswana. We worked together a, a long time ago in Zimbabwe. He also used to work for, for big organizations here, Old Mucho uh, and Delta uh, and many others. Uh, Mr. Mshayendebu, I hand over to you so that you can take us through your presentation. Uh, people can put their questions on the chat, but I also give them an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Uh, it's over to you. Thank you, Memory. It's always a pleasure. Uh, I appreciate your invitation and uh, it's, a, it's great to be talking to you, colleagues. Uh, our topic today, leadership judgments, navigating blips and blunders. Just consider uh, yourself, uh, have you ever stepped on a banana peel? Have you had that experience before? I've been there. I know what it, uh, what it means. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, in this uh, age of uh, machine intelligence, I've got a very loyal and uh, consistent, uh, reliable um, assistant. Her name is Adele. When she makes mistakes, she says error, unexpected error, quitting. And all I need to do is to say, okay. Now, with the old man, it's not that simple. Uh, the old man of uh, human intelligence, he will say, ah, well, uh, well you know, uh, mind you, uh, in any case, uh, what are you talking about? Uh, th th this is my house anyway. I mean, look, if that's the way you're going to look at things, maybe you go. In reality, though, uh, on the matter of leadership, it's only, the only mistake is, to, is not making mistakes because you're going to make mistakes. If you are so careful that you don't want to make mistakes, then you are not going to be able to lead. So there's nothing at all to be embarrassed about, uh, about making mistakes or stepping on the banana peel. We are in the, the, the discipline of uh, identifying leadership. Let's talk about the man in the corner, the man in the corner office. What kind of attributes does he have? He's explicit, clear, unmistakable, he's steadfast, absolute, there's no doubting uh, where he stands, he's determined, he's confident, he's certain, he's committed, he's dignified, down to earth, he's pivotal, he's a key part of the organization. That's the man in, in the corner, he's in charge. Now, let's talk about leadership knowing. How does uh, the leader understand? Four things uh, apply. The first one being the conscious process. And if we went around uh, that circle, there is the unconscious processes. Then of course, there's the judgments and the behavior, which is the matter that uh, we are talking about today. Let's just go back to the Conscious, how does the, the, the leader know? There's the explicit analysis and evaluation and the processes here are, can be, the awareness can be fairly sharp to hazy. If we compare that with the unconscious processes, uh, there's implicit analysis and evaluation. The judgments are made on what is implicit, what is covert versus what is overt in the conscious. And uh, it's at that level where it's, mm -hmm. one is not aware, there's oblivion, and the oblivion can be very much at the surface, or it can range to very deep, where you really need to go down uh, into the unconscious. So if we go back again to the conscious uh, side, the question really here is to say, is there free will? Can the person freely exercise that consciousness? How about the possibilities? What possibilities are we not identifying in that conscious mind? 
particularly given that we have got bounded awareness. We are only aware of what we are able to see or to hear or to feel through our senses or through uh, our human brain. What reality out there are we not able to see? But come back again to the unconscious uh, uh, side of uh, knowing. That comes out of genetics, the socialization, the education, the dogmas that we come up with, that, we ca that go underlying, that actually underpin uh, the judgments that we make. But now let's move to the area of the actual judgments and the behaviors themselves. What are we looking at there when we're exercising those judgments? Presumably we are guided by seeking the truth, the right and the wrong, or the right to the wrong, because maybe it's sitting on a scale. It might not be a bipolar uh, situation. One also is considering, is it just or is it unjust? It could be bipolar or it could be a range. And at the end of the day, if we are looking at the leader, can we then say it was the leader who took that decision? Can we give him credit or do we hold him accountable to that? I'm basically saying leadership knowing comes from the conscious processes, the unconscious processes, and the judgments and the behaviors, and this really is just a cycle. These things are going round and round. They are not necessarily happening independent of each other. Now, let's go into the core of our talk today, the issue of bias, particularly the bias of the unconscious side or the unconscious type. Let's look uh, at the picture that we have there. Uh, this is uh, the Lady Justice. Lady Justice has got two key features. She is holding the scales of justice, the fairness, the balance. And on the other hand, on the right hand, she's in the right hand, she's holding a sword so she can pass the judgment. But notice also that uh, the Lady, Lady Justice's eyes are closed. That way, she is not biased by who she is looking at. Works well, doesn't it? It's fine as long as there is no bias. What is bias in, in any case? Bias to me suggests a lopsidedness or a stiffness. It's about undue favor for or against a particular thinking idea person. And potentially it is harmful or unfair, particularly if you couple it with uh, power. So bias is not inherently a bad thing, but uh, when you put it in the hands or when it's exercised by someone who has got power, it could be seriously damaging. Now, having said that as a, a little bit of a background, uh, looking at uh, uh, the whole idea of uh, how we know uh, and in particular, the issue of a, a, a bias, unconscious bias. Let's look at the contents. What is there in our Tupperware uh, containers? Three things. The first thing that we are going to be considering in this talk is the origins and significance of unconscious bias. I will then want us to move into how we can moderate, how we can mitigate uh, that unconscious bias. And we'll be looking at intrapersonal factors, things that are within the individual, interpersonal factors, things that are there as we interact. And we'll look also at the operations, the practices, the things that we do. And also, finally, we will look at the cause. Where are we going to? How much, how, how does that create a bias? I would then want to uh, move to conclude by looking at admission, having a cause as a positive leadership bias. That basically is what we have in our three containers. We're going to move fairly quickly. Uh, and in particular, we will look at the areas under point two, those issues of moderation. So I would ask that we strap up uh, because we've got quite a lot uh, to cover. And to the greater extent, really, the containers really are going to offer us 
just a taste. Uh, there is not enough time for us to go into too much detail in any of the areas. But hopefully, the test creates an appetite for each one of us to go and do our own independent searches. Now wait for it. The first point to consider is that bias is inherent in all leadership judgments. There's no running away from it. In essence, decision-making behavior is inexact. It's not like Adele. It's human, uh, the human mind. Distortions and compromises will come in. There's no running away from that. It's important for us to be aware of that because then we become a little bit less cocky. We become more humble. Distortions and compromises will always seep in in leadership judgments. Naturally, there will be adverse consequences if bias is not uh, moderated in one way or, or the other. As a result of that, the primary mitigation will stem from self-knowledge, self-control, and managing how we think and behave. Next point, going into a, a little bit of a drill down, we say their leadership uh, decision making is inexact. It's because bias is part of human functioning. The brain has got limited capacity. The human brain has got a limited uh, capacity. Any brain has got a limited capacity. Uh, and issues like, for instance, personality. I look at personality as a bias. It's a form of bias because we've got particular inclinations, we've got particular tendencies. It means there are certain things that we don't tend to do or that we don't uh, uh, tend to see, things that we don't tend to see. It's just human nature. In a sense, you could say that, in fact, we are systematically irrational. We've got filters uh, that we use uh, that get in, in the way of uh, understanding or knowing reality. In a sense, what we are talking about is a situation where you've got organized disorder. Obviously, in the extreme uh, instances, it becomes uh, something that would need uh, maybe the attention of uh, our colleagues in the clinical profession. I would also argue that there is nothing like a leadership expert. It's impossible. If a leadership decision making is inexact, how can you have an expert? If anybody was to come to me and say they are a leadership expert, I would say they're lying. It's a myth. There's nothing like that. Distortions and compromises will always come in. And they come in either from the cognitive side or from the emotional side. On the cognitive side, one is looking at things like, for instance, your memories, things that you remember things that you have experienced, uh, they focus you to pay attention to particular things. But I think the big timber really is from the uh, emotional side, the fears, the attachments, the values, issues of power. So the old man gets concerned and start, starts saying, ha, hang on, uh, I need to take a decision with this boy here. I mean, look, who is he anyway? I'm the father around here. Things like your ambition, where are you trying, what are you trying to, to achieve? Those can also uh, distort the judgments that you make, or they might actually promote the judgments that you're going to make. We talked about the cost of bias. Now, I would ask you to look very carefully at that uh, little girl's uh, eyes and say to yourself, if you're taking a decision as a leader, what could be the consequences? Now, we know that decision-making is very core to executive work. So if bias creeps in, then we've got a problem. It tends to undermine policy-making. The designs and executions that come will then, end, as a result, be less than ideal. 
it, it, it may therefore be helpful to start with ignorance and just assume that you don't know. That way you can be able to ask fresh questions. You are not coming up with any preconceived ideas. Now, let's wait for it. We're going now into the mitigation processes. We talked about self-knowledge, self-control, and managing how we think and behave. Why? It's because the contemporary leader has got to deal with wicked problems. Who we'll unpack that? What do we mean? Second point is that you need to unlearn in order to engage wicked problems properly or effectively. We will come back to talking about what wicked problems are. But it's, it's necessary to defy the fictions and to exercise wise judgments. One needs to be agile in decision making. You cannot afford to be stiff. You need to be agile, to be ambidextrous, not to just basically say, oh, well, look, I'm an introvert. Everybody knows that I'm an introvert. The situation might need for you to be uh, extroverted. One needs to apply new value systems, apply new dynamics, new technologies to decision making. All these things come in into self-knowledge, self-control, and managing how we think and behave. So let's go a little bit uh, deeper. What are wicked problems anyway? They, are, they relate to the unprecedented challenges that we are coming up, things that we have not uh, uh, experienced before. Maybe this is coming out of, not maybe, it, they are coming out of industrialize, industrialization. The pace of the world has become very fast. There's social complexity, technical difficulties, and you will find that conventional solu solutions tend to lead to undesirable consequences. There is no solution. There are no bullet, uh, silver bullets uh, uh, in the world that we're living in, in terms of uh, particularly leadership judgments. We are also faced with multiple stakeholders when you are dealing with uh, uh, wicked problems. Expectations and demands tend to, con to conflict. There is not just simply one demand. No, you are trying to address quite a number of stake stakeholders and the, the perspectives can be very competing. It's very difficult to tell what the ramifications are going to be on the whole. That's the nature of a, a situation where you've got multiple stakeholders. That's in the nature of wicked problems. You're also faced with a situation where it's very difficult, where it's very difficult to formulate the problems. From that one side where there is clarity to the other side where there is uh, the deep blue uh, sea. Somewhere in between there, you have got to formulate what are the issues, what are the problems, how do we actually define what we're contending with. There are no obvious solutions. And often the solutions generate their own problems. That is in the nature of wicked problems. So one of the first mitigations is that of unlearning, we have been saying. What is that? Why? It's because basically knowledge gets obsolete, particularly because of the unprecedented challenges and the highly dynamic environment that we are living in. You can't depend on the knowledge that you acquired uh, yesterday, certainly not uh, last year or uh, in the last day or a, a decade ago. One needs to empty one's cup to be refreshed. We need to unlearn. Now, we're going to be talking about discarding, getting rid of uh, the solutions that we had or the perspectives or the views that we had. Why? Because those create blind spots. And you know what happens when you are dealing with blind spots. It means that you're actually likely to run into major problems. You need fresh eyes experience. We're going to unpack these points, but just to look at uh, discarding overall, you need to have critical unlearning. We will unpack that. We also need to engage in deep unlearning. And the, uh, the final point there is that you also may need to actually engage in deliberate non-action, just refusing to act. 
These are some of the processes of discarding which we'll unpack now. What's the fresh eye experience, fresh eyes experience we are talking about? Just check out that uh, youngster there. He's obviously been crying. It's not like he's hungry. He looks uh, well looked after. But he, has been, he seems to have been through some lesson. Somewhere in his eyes there, I see some contentment. Maybe he has understood the experience. He has learned his lesson. I don't know. But essentially, the fresh eyes experience is a rational process of saying, what happened here? What has gone down? Uh, is it a question of the, my mother doesn't like me? Or have I been a naughty boy? Or have I been missing the point? But using rational processes. Let's unpack the issue of critical unlearning. Now this, this, uh, can, can, it, it, this is actually a public process uh, and it, it happens in, in collective uh, in, uh, situations. It's a team process. Adele is not uh, responding as well as uh, I would want. Uh, um, uh, there's a, a little bit of a delay in terms of uh, responding. She's behaving like uh, the old man. Just try that again. Okay, there we are. But uh, the critical learning is more directed towards the patterns uh, of relating and organizing. It's how is the team functioning? It's about reflecting uh, on things like, for instance, the power relationships. Who is the boss around here? What is he thinking? Are people paying attention to who uh, has got the, the, the money bags and things like that? What are the dynamics that are taking place in the, in the team? It's about also working through the associated tensions and feelings. Who feels happy? Who feels uh, hurt? Who feels uh, exposed? Uh, and bringing to light alternative uh, perspectives. So you're working together uh, as a team to unlearn or to do things, to see things differently. That is critical unlearning. Now, let's just move to deep unlearning. Deep unlearning, uh, as it would suggest, is more inward looking. This is a critical review of uh, those underlying judgment premises that we are utilizing or what one is utilizing as an individual. What is the basis upon which I take my decisions? And challenging your personal and professional identity. So I'm a psychologist. Am I seeing these things because I'm look looking at them as a psychologist? What if, say, for instance, I was a civil engineer? Could I look at things differently? How do I identify myself? My, my identity itself can be the source of bias. Because if I say, oh, look, I'm a man, <laughs> what am I missing because I've said I'm a man? What if I was to say I'm a kid? Would I not see things differently? Generally, when you go into deep unlearning, there is often surprise, confusion. You tend to start bring out the emotional undertones because you are questioning your very being, the very fabric of your own being. A Harvard a professor called Robert Keegan came up with a, a, a theory of a adult development, uh, looking at the issues of a, a how human consciousness develops. And he came up with a, a theory which says that the human consciousness and is an, it grows like an unfolding of ways of organizing consciousness or organizing experiences. And as this, just imagine like a rose, for instance, opening the buds and until it opens up to a full rose. As it opens up, it's not just simply a question of uh, one system re uh, replacing another. No, these actually are the petals become more and more complex. He has got a, a or he, he came up with a, a process where he identified a number of orders of consciousness. 
five orders of consciousness. And let me just uh, take you through them fairly quickly. He said, we start off with uh, the impulsive mind, which is about uh, early childhood. And then we move to the imperial mind, which is around uh, adolescence. And surprise, surprise, 6% of adults are actually in that, uh, are to be found in that uh, uh, level of consciousness. I would argue that it could even be more. And then you move to the socialized mind, uh, where 58% of adults are tend to be found. This is the tribal mind, where you now realize that you are part of a, a community. Uh, so it's us, uh, like, for instance, uh, or uh, us uh, Zimbabweans, uh, or us Africans. It's tribal thinking. And then you move on to the self-authoring mind, where 35% of the adults are to be found. I think these percentages tend to be indicative. They probably could be more or less. But the self-authoring mind is probably what uh, people like uh, uh, McLennan uh, would say. Uh, uh, is it McLennan? Now, who talks about uh, internal locus of control, where you now are now identifying yourself. Uh, uh, and you can chart your own a course. It's not about belonging to a particular tribal grouping or social group grouping, but you now have got your own, you author who you are. Uh, and I think Mark Leland is the one who is saying, no, no, uh, I think who is it uh, uh, who talks about um, the pinnacle of growth uh, being self actualization? Uh, Maslow. Uh, it's that kind of thinking where when you now have self-actualized, you know what you want and you arrive. It's in that kind of a mind frame, in, in that kind of a consciousness uh, that uh, you, you, you achieve uh, your own identity or your own uh, way of looking at things. But Keegan says, no, you can actually grow to the level of a self-transforming consciousness where very few people actually get to that level. And I think, in fact, uh, and uh, indeed, Keegan himself uh, also said, yes, you can actually be coaxed. You can grow uh, into having a self-transforming mind where you think now beyond yourself, beyond others, beyond the systems. And basically, you've got a mind that is evolving, that continues to evolve. Uh, it's a mind which I think is a transcending mind there is no black or white anymore. These are all different shades of cool. They are all, you can be able to hold contradicting, contradictory uh, positions and quite comfortably be able to operate. Obviously, we're moving fairly quickly here. Now, uh, Keegan and Leahy, a colleague of, uh, of his uh, called Leahy, uh, they came up with uh, the idea of intrapersonal change, that moderation that we're talking about which uh, is premised on an understanding that there is this feature called immunity to change, not resistance to change, but immunity to change. Now imagine an, an immunity where if this is a situation where your own body is basically re rejecting a change that you would like to uh, uh, undertake. People get stuck. They, they are not refusing to, to, to change, they are, they are stuck. They get stuck. Uh, they get stuck in ingrained thinking and behavioral patterns. And uh, as a result, their flow, they, they are, their alignment to the challenges that are uh, in the environment is compromised. And uh, this change approach basically is about diversifying mindsets and behavioral options. It in injects more flexibility. Uh, when you go through that kind of intrapersonal change, you become uh, more flexible, more agile. What are we talking about? Uh, the process that uh, we'll, I'll take you through uh, basically says uh, you've got current mind, the current mindsets are holding, back, holding you back. You're trying to cycle, you're trying to uh, go up to meet these uh, big challenges. Your current mindset is, is pulling you back, despite the fact that your skills and will is trying to push you up. It's just not happening. That's an immunity to change. And the ideal thing really would be a situation where you overturn that uh, immunity to change and 
uh, you have bigger and more complex mindsets, uh, which then allow your skills and will to take you forward, uh, to make you uh, cope with the, the more challenging uh, uh, realities uh, that one has got to deal with. I think it's more than just simply mindsets, it's also behavioral patterns. Now, very quickly, uh, Lee, uh, Keegan and Lee talk about the accelerator on the left hand side at the bottom and the brakes. So the accelerator would be, for instance, uh, in according to the uh, 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 process, which is a four column process. Column one is where you set the behavioral change goal. So I want to stop smoking or I want to become a better delegator. That's the accelerator. That's the thing that's pushing you to change. You then go into column two. The column two uh, a pros, uh, a process generally is not too difficult. It's one way you're saying, okay, what is it that I'm doing or not doing, which works against that goal that I would like to change, that I would like to achieve in column one. Like I pass off the task to subordinates and then micromanage. This is where you're now engaging that X-ray. The X-ray is going into, it will, it will lead into the breaks and ultimately the solution. But let's just go back again to the column one, uh, column two rather. Uh, so you have now understood uh, what you do currently. This process in my own experience, it's not too difficult. It's when you move into column three, more so into column four, that's when really it becomes fairly difficult and you are now grappling with the breaks. So column three is where you unearth the hidden committing commitment, uh, uh, commitments. So this person wants to be a better delegator, but he, we, you, you can be able to surface that the person is saying, I'm a vouched expert and I will not make mistakes. I don't want to make mistakes. So he has got a commitment to being correct first time. That is actually a commitment that is working against him. If you go into uh, column four, where you unearth the underlying big assumption, this person is saying, oh, oh I'm going to have an embarrassment, an embar embar embarrassing failure if I, I try this out. So these two, the commitment and the big assumptions basically apply the breaks. If you don't work through them, there's not going to be a change. But if you work through them, it then becomes possible to move to the solution stage which is basically undertaking the behavioral tryouts. Those behavioral tri tryouts, according to this change process, is undertaking those smart uh, moves. The smart being safe, modest, actionable, research and test oriented behavior. So these are, it's biting small chunks and trying out, testing out, and being able actually to realize that no, it doesn't hurt. Now, obviously, this is a very quick sketching of uh, uh, this intrapersonal change process. But let's proceed. The final area uh, of, uh, or is it the final? But I think it is. Uh, we, we talked about deliberate non-action. The Gandhi way, just resisting, passive resistance. In this case here, you view and use your current standard operating processes or procedures dif differently. You don't continue doing the same thing when it's not getting you the results. So you remain open to possibilities. It's not like you're stuck. No, you are quite aware of what you could be doing or what you think you might be doing, but you say, no, I'm not doing it. You refuse to do what is not working. So you don't continue just hitting your head against the, the, the wall. Now, Let's wait for it. 